Okay, so welcome to the second lecture, the second conversation for this year's theme, the Year of Wellness. And this is me. My name is Laura Forsyth. I am a counseling psychologist by training and inclination, and I am the counseling psychologist here at Moore Park College working out of the health center. I do not teach. I am a little too scattered to teach, but really love clinical work, work have worked sometimes in the past with folks at Access, students with disabilities. Um, I have a private practice as well in Camarillo. My specialty area is people with anxiety and adults and college students with ADHD, which, is I, lear which I learned about here at Moore Park College, and I've been here since about 2002. Um, so why am I doing this? Well, you know, as a psychologist, I am someone who has a tremendous interest in technology and particularly in the interaction between human beings and technology and particularly with regard to smartphones and how we can manage these incredible tools where we, I am carrying around the some knowledge of humanity in my pocket. Access to just pretty much almost everything. And how we can do that in a way that works for us because I don't know about you, but when I have near limitless access to near limitless stimulation, I'm going to fall down the rabbit hole. Which is another nice way of saying that, hi, I'm Laura, I'm a smartphone addict. Come on, guys, no, thank you. Somebody knows the drill. <laughs> okay. And I'd say kind of, but my kids have said, eh, no, addict. Okay, thanks. So did you know? Your smartphone actually controls you. It can make you do what it wants you to do. It can bend you to its will. And while you believe that it is you're in charge, you know, I bought it. I, I picked out the case. I did all the little stuff with it. In fact, it is the master and I am the servant. And it's true. I mean, it's the phone, the phone that we have in our pocket or more frequently, the one in our hand. By the way, too, if anybody is interested just parenthetically about um, having notes or any of the slides, those will be posted um, on the Health Center's website or actually access accessible through the Health Center's website after, after the lecture later on today. So just FYI. So, you know, people walk around. I was just looking as I was walking over here. People have their phones in their hands. And it's not that your phone hates you. I mean, it's not that it wants to dominate or subjugate you. Nobody is, you know, the phone is not going ha 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 and when you're not looking. It loves you. It loves you. And you, well, you love it too. Admit it. <laughs> it's sweet. It's a, it's a forever relationship. And that's the problem. You know, but you say, wait, 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 no, 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 hold the phone, pun intended. Um, for sure I love my phone, but actually it's what it does. I mean, this is just a device, right? It's what it does. It's that it connects me to the entire world. You know, anytime I want to, I can connect to my friends, I can listen to stuff, I can watch things, I can look up any damn thing that I ever placed. It's, it's the universe in my pocket. That's what I really want about this. Well, that'd be nice if that was true. But in fact, we have come to love our phones. There's more to it. So what is it that you and I love about our phones? We, you know, what is, and what does smartphones have to do with wellness? What, you know, here we are, year of wellness. So let's start right now by talking about wellness. We're going to just sort of step out. This is a theoretical thing, could be on the test, you never know, because this is the World Health Organization's definition of wellness. So take a look. It's an active process. Notice process. It's not a thing you do once. It's a thing that you do on an ongoing basis of becoming aware of and making choices towards a healthy and fulfilling life. It's this when you're in a state of wellness, it is a state of well-being. It is physical, mental, social, and it's not just the absence of disease. It's not that I'm not, I'm, it's an absence of stress, an absence of distre distress, an absence of being ill. It's this other bigger state. It's pretty sweet. A lot of, of various uh, ideas and models of wellness have been put forward. Some of them have five dimensions. Some of them have six, seven, eight, nine. Here's one that's pretty solid. I mean, they're all essentially comparable. But this one's kind of nice. It lays it out. And so we can think about emotional wellness. We can think about financial wellness. You know, w w am I secure? Have I gotten adequate access to resources? Environmental wellness. 
what's around me in my environment? Am I living in a place that's, that is clean, that's safe, that isn't polluted? You know, considerations in that area. Intellectual wellness, very much a bar, part of what we're doing here. Uh, physical wellness, recognizing and serving our needs for being active, eating things that support our body and are healthful and delicious and delightful. Sleep, we'll talk about sleep. Um, all that kind of stuff. Occupational wellness. As a person who is blessed with occupational wellness, I gotta tell you, it is one of the most awesome things in the world and I wish it for everybody here. To like what you do sustains every single day. And so whether it is for, with your vocation or your avocation, the things that you do that you may not learn, earn money at, I wish that for everyone here. Spiritual wellness, a sense of meaningfulness and purpose in life, a connection to something bigger than us. And social wellness, that sense of connection, belonging, being a part of, not, you know, us human beings, we do not do well in isolation. We are wired as social animals, and it's an integral part of our wellness. And it's, gonna, it's a big factor in our use of, sm of phones, as we'll talk. So it makes sense, yeah? I mean, there's, we could add things on there. We could, you know, talk about them in little different ways. But there's this multifaceted thing, and then it's a process. OK, so we're good with this. So how do we create wellness, this process? It's a series of choices, yeah? The little ones and the big ones. And it's the day-by-day -day stuff. It's what I do each day. It isn't like, OK, I'm going to be, have wellness in my life, and I make a decision. It's what I do when I get up in the morning. And oftentimes, my wellness in the morning has everything to do with what I did the night before, as in when I went to bed, or the quality of my surroundings, or what was on my mind. All of that stuff is supported. What do I listen to? What do I eat? You know, the, all those things, the, the activities, moment by moment, choice by choice through the day. It's this aggregation. It's ongoing process. And there are choices. There are so many choices, we don't even see them going by. Some of them we can see. Some of them we know all too well. But many of them, we don't, aren't even aware of them, even though we make them repeatedly. So let's connect it up. How do the choices we make about using our smartphones, or actually phones in general, but man, you know, tech in general, but smartphones as this, you know, it's in my pocket. It's in my hand. So I want to talk about phone, smartphones. How does it affect our health and our wellness? So we're hoping for the next um, hour, maybe a little bit less, we'll be able to talk about this with a degree of objectivity and some curiosity, too. You know, obviously, I've got some ideas. I'm kind of an opinionated person. And, uh, but also, too, I'm drawing from the research and drawing from just in all science that we stand on the shoulders of those that came before us. So I'm going to try to pull some of that together for you. But this isn't just going to be me telling you. I'd like to have kind of a conversation. Because you, many of you, those of you particularly who are of um, what we say traditional college age, you know, age about 17 to, I don't know, early 20s, are coming up in a time when tech was present for you, the internet, was present for you from your early, early years. And if you have younger sibs, cousins, or your own children, they are the generation who is coming up with screens, you know, devices, pads, tablets, and phones being present since infancy. We are shifting. We are changing. People in my generation came fully formed into adulthood with no access to screens. I mean, you know, I got the internet happened when I was in graduate school. When I was an undergraduate, to do stats, we did punch cards. Oh, long ago. Um, you know, among the redwood trees of UC Santa Cruz, etc. And, you know, we looked up stuff in books and journals. You know, there was no internet. I had to get, like, 10 years later, go to graduate school. Yeah, I know. He's like, whoa, how do you do research? How do you look stuff up if you can't just go brrrr? and have all of you know, humanity's knowledge available to you under your fingertips. We did it. And you know, it's OK. You don't know any better. So anyway, so I want to you know, think about it, because we've got different perspectives here depending on age, depending on our, our just kind of our own uh, stance about things, our own points of view. And I'm hoping to have some conversation. And there is a lot to discuss. Lots and lots and lots. So first off, we're going to have to talk about the th I mean, I'm just going to sort of list some of the stuff we aren't really going to talk about, OK? Just we're going to go through a bunch of stuff really fast. Um, we're not going to talk about some of the, the uh, data that is starting to link the use of cell phones, possibility of higher risk for cancer. If you're interested in that, you can go to the World Health Organization. Great place to start. We're not going to talk about the chronic hand and wrist pain that many of us develop from texting and from all this time sitting like this. Eh, yeah, I, could, I could talk about that, but we're not going to. 
And we're not going to talk about the neck pain that you get from continually holding your head forward, although we probably should be talking about this, particularly for your people who are of traditional college age, because you are during, you know, as your body in, is forming, you are spending a whole lot of time like this. And when you're like the, you know, when you were like this, it's about 12 pounds of pressure in the back of the bursa in the back in my neck. And then the more my head goes down, the more pressure there is. And you know, people spend amazing amounts of time. You know the posture I'm talking. And our necks are not really made for that. This was not like, you know, the habitual posture during the Paleolithic and the previous 200, 300, 100,000 years that our particular structure evolved. And so I think uh, basically just you might want to be aware of it, otherwise you're going to be paying a lot of money to chiropractors and further in your, in your life. I'm not really talking about this, just so you know. But see this thing where you kind of stick your elbows against your ribs and, and hold the phone up? Look at the difference in my neck as opposed to like that. Just saying. Okay, I'm not talking about this anymore. Oh, and we're not going to talk about how phones, people focus on their phones instead of each other. We won't talk about the effects of smartphone use on relationships. Love Bizarro. Love Bizarro. Do you don't mind? OK. And we're not even going to talk about one of the biggest, biggest deals, which is the danger of driving while distracted. This particular picture, I think, is from something in 2011, where a guy, high school guy or young guy was driving his truck, and he was texting, and that's what happened. I don't think anybody died. Yeah, actually, that, right, do you see the truck? Kind of the part that looks like a smushed up Coke can? Yeah, that's what happened. Ugh. And we're not going to talk about fatalities. There's data. You can look the stuff up. There's a little bit of data. Um, I will say, though, that drivers in their 20s do make up 27% of the direct distracted drivers in crashes, but drivers in their 20s are not 20% of the driving public, 27% of the driving public. It is disproportionate. Just saying. Okay. And we won't even talk about the risk of smartphone use while walking, which happens every day, including here at Moorpark College. You know, not about, we're not going to really get into it, and we're not going to talk about the fact that in 2011 the stats were that uh, 100 and what, 1,152 people were treated in hospital ERs in the United States. They had injuries that bad that they had to go to the ER, not just to the urgent care of their doctor the next day, the ER. Uh, like somebody who walked into a phone pole and another kid who was playing a game on his phone while he walked across the street, got clipped by a car. Or the 57-year-old woman who fell off a curb lacerating her face. I mean, it's, it, you know, you go on YouTube, you can find all kinds of stuff. In fact, you might even find something that we'll, be, we'll talk about for a sec. We can talk about the time with the bear. Anybody hear about this? Two years ago, three years ago in La Crescenta? You know, bears come down at night through the canyons, and then in the morning, oh, wow, I'm in the middle of the neighborhood. And he's like, oh, what's back there? He's looking at this little walkway between two houses. There's a guy <laughs> texting on his phone. I guess the bear's kind of like behind where the palm tree is, but you know, he doesn't see him. And then he does. <laughs> so, did anybody hear about this? This was on TV. This was a big deal. It was, you know, we've kind of come a long way since the Paleolithic, yeah? You know, this sort of, like if you and I, we were all walking down the path here in Moore Park about, I don't know, 3,000 years ago, or actually around here, not that long ago because you know before the advent of, of technology and when the place was full of oak trees and, and acorns and thus rich 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 with bears and mountain lions and all matter of predators because there was a rich food source and thus a lot of animals we would not be going along like this we'd be talking and we'd be yakking and we're going down to the stream with our baskets to get the acorns to make the mush and we're going to be scanning the whole time most of our lives in humanity has done that. We don't do that now, do we? So anyway, and we won't talk about taking your smartphone to bed. There's some amazing survey data out there, by the way, though. It's kind of interesting to think about it. You might think about yourself, too, like taking your phone to bed with you. What an interesting idea. It's kind of easy to do. But um, how does it affect the quality of your sleep? And we won't talk about 
the effect of staring directly into a blue light, which mimics, is very similar in wavelength to the light of early morning, which then comes through your retina and hits the back of your eye, and that information is transmitted directly to your pineal gland, which controls sleep-wake cycles. And so at 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 1 a.m., you are essentially telling your brain, wakey, wakey, it's 6 a.m. And people kind of, like, it sort of throws people's sleep-wake cycles off. Anyway, I'm not going to say anything more. But if you find that you feel a little groggy, you might want to consider this. Anyway, we won't talk about how the loss of daydreaming, because you don't have to be bored anymore. You, you know, if there's a single moment that you don't have something to do, you can play. And so that time that our minds need to just kind of dink around and put our ideas together, we don't we get we just it we didn't mean to not do it but like when was the last time that you were actually bored and had nothing to do for 15 minutes to half an hour oh good woman someone's like yeah me okay i'll tell you I, my kids get in the car i pick them up they're high school age boom phone, phones come out you know they're looking at tumblr or they're screwing around or playing a game in my psychotherapy office i spend hundreds some odd dollars every month or every year excuse me on magazines I'm about ready to give it up because they don't get read. People are on their phones for the large part. And we're just, we're used to it. It's not a big deal. Except what happened to that time that you muse? You, when you think about ideas that you get for things, what are you doing when you get those ideas? You wish. And are there particular times of the day or situations that you're in where you find yourself thinking of something? Oh, wow, hey, I got this idea. I'll tell you where it happens to me in the shower and, then, and then it's really it's always a little frustrating because then either I have to get out and find something to write down and it gets all smudgy and smeared or I have to like try to figure out some way of remembering it but it's a time when my head can kind of freewheel and I come up with things ideas like for this lecture or just things in general because my mind's not occupied by something else anyway I said I wouldn't talk about it I'm sorry anyway we're not going to talk about um, how phones affect memory and thus academic success but I will tell you, just really quickly, pretend that I didn't, um, about a piece of research that said that there, if, I don't know if anybody's heard about this, the thing that you can do in 10 to 15 minutes that improves your test scores and your long-term memory for information after a lecture by about 40, 45%. Anybody heard about that? You want to know? Okay. It's not real thrilling, but after you get a class, you go, and within the first couple of minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, find yourself a place to sit down and review your notes. Just go through them again. Maybe rewrite the stuff that you weren't sure about. Flag the things that you, the concepts where you, like, you started writing something and didn't get all the way through and you're not sure about that information. Like, oh yeah, I've got to figure out this, got to figure out that, make a little list. But just sort of tidy them up, review them. Just kind of, oh yeah, 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 go through them again. Maybe rewrite a little. Um, and then look at the syllabus or whatever you've got and say, okay, what do I, when am I going to do next? Just right there, what's all really fresh, you know, you get done with the lecture or the, pre you know, whatever it is you've done in class, and it's there in your head, and so you work with it right then. Research has been done in this area that if you do that, what's happening is all that information that you have, well, I'll show you. This is the process of memory. Incoming information comes into sensory um, memory. Sally is talking. And she's presenting, and there's information, and people are presenting, all this stuff happens. Sensory data is coming in. And it goes into initial sensory memory, just kind of a, a sort of an initial holding process. And if we don't atten pay attention to it, it's lost. If you're thinking about something else, looking at your phone, look, reading something else, that data can go through, but it doesn't stick at all. It doesn't get grabbed. But let's imagine that you're attentive, you're a good student, you pay attention, and you are attending to that, and now it goes into this process of short-term memory, what we call working memory. It holds there for a while, seconds, minutes, not so long. And you have to maintain it through rehearsal. You have to kind of keep thinking about it. This is why we take notes, is we it elaborates us, it elaborates what the information we're getting, because we're processing, we're writing, we're sort of thinking about it, and it gives us a reference point, a cue, to come back to, to stimulate recall later. So it's lost if it's not encoded or rehearsed. Okay? Well, so, and then from there, it 
there's further encoding and storage, elaborative rehearsal, the, the green one, which is where you think about, okay, how does this fit in with whatever else I know, or you talk to people about it, or you go back and look at the book, you're elaborating on it. You do a practice problem, you do a you know, short essay, those are elaboration strategies that weave it into what you already know. Okay, and this is the process of learning. And then eventually get stored into long-term memory. Okay, so what happens when you do this? Person gets out of, everybody gets out of class. Imagine everyone walking out of class. If you were standing outside a classroom door and every, a class got out, what would you see people doing? They go on their phones. So there you are during that time when all the stuff is fresh and, oh wait, there's this other stuff I'm gonna look at my Twitter feed. And all that information is sitting there in short-term memory just waiting to be encoded. It's the golden moment. But if you overlay it with other data, it decays. And gone, gone, gone. You have to go back and restructure it. You have to go back and reread it. People say, man, I read that. I know, I know we talked about it in class. I guess we talked about it in class. I read it. I don't remember any of that. People come to me and say, do I have ADD? And, well, let's talk about what you're doing. Sometimes yes, but sometimes, a lot of times not. So back to this idea about wellness as a series of choices. That's a choice that we're not even sure that we aren't even necessarily aware that we're making. And it's not so much is this good or bad, it's just like, what do we, you know, what's, how do we process, and what do we do, and what happens? Okay. Make sense, this stuff? Okay. So what are we going to talk about? What are, you know, like, uh, if we're not going to talk about this stuff, except maybe a little, I kind of cheated. What are we really going to talk about? The empirically demonstrated fact that us human beings have far less of uh, spontaneous, volitional, conscious control over our smartphone use than we think we do. Which means that if you actually really think, oh yeah, I'm totally in control, I don't use it too much, I, you know, I'm, I'm t completely on top of this, that not only are you mistaken, but you are setting yourself up to be a sucker, and thus a servant. So we're gonna talk about today is why this happens and how it happens, and if that isn't what you choose, what is it that you can do about it in a reasonable way, okay? Now, have you ever seen smart thing people, I mean, like, you know, smart, competent, reasonable people do stupid things because of their smartphone use? Have you ever been maybe one of those people, possibly yourself? Um, we could even take a minute and if just like a minute together to make a really fast list of the dumb, risky, stupid ass things that people do while using their smartphones. Quickly, please. Don't raise your hand, just shout it out. Driving, yes, thank you. Walking, we not looking for, yeah, yeah, bless his heart, man, that poor guy. Laughing, like, oh, yeah, 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 so there's this weird thing in, in your, like, everyone's going, okay, great, thanks. Yeah, and they don't share it, you know. Take, yeah, right, right, you're solely, you're engaged in this moment, and then somebody, you know, all of a sudden, it's like, what? This light goes on, it's very distracting. Say again? Yes, all that. Um, how about the, oh, I'm just gonna look at this thing here for a second. You ever done the thing where like your phone, the alarm goes off, and you pick up the phone to turn off the alarm, and then there's this notification, you look at the notification, and then you see this other thing, and then about like half an hour to an hour and a half later, you're still sitting in bed, and you kind of got this weird taste in your mouth because you haven't brushed your teeth and you're hungry and you're still like in your jammies or, you know, it's, and then, oh man, it's 11 o'clock, you know, and there was no intention in any of this? All the time, all the time. So, anyway. It's amusing. Like, this would be so, you know, that, like, this, this takes rid of a lot of the walking problems, yeah? You just have it and go down the street. My husband, for a period of time, was, uh, was working in a, in a company down in Beverly Hills, driving from Cam to Beverly Hills. Whew. But early in the morning, he could pull it off. So the first couple of weeks he was down there, he's coming back and telling us about, you know, this whole interesting place, right there, being down on the heart of Wilshire Boulevard. And he said it was amazing, this is like 10 years ago, that 
he would, he would like mimicking for it. The people are walking up and down the street and they're looking at their text phones and they're texting and they're looking at their phones and they're bumping into each other and nobody makes eye contact. And it's a miracle they aren't, you know, splatting and falling down. It was just, it was so striking. That was 10 years ago. Now, you know, Camarillo Moore Park, every place else. So anyway, but really, you know, why are we doing this? Ha, ha, ha. You know, it is funny, but why do we do it? And why don't we know better? And what about self-control? Why is this so difficult? In fact, how is it that a device, and not even a very large one, can have such apparent sway and override my rational control, my conscious choice? Because have there been times in which I have said, oh, no, I'm going to do x, and then I do y repeatedly? But I still think I can do X. I still think, oh, yeah, I can, I'm just going to look at this and then I'm going to go blah, 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 you know, do whatever else I need to do. Why is this? And when did you agree to be the servant? You know, this is what I think about my phone. I tell it what to do. But in fact, this actually might be what's happening. I try not to like bonk my head against the floor. And usually the problem is with our brains. More specifically, it's with these cortical processes that regulate um, attention, emotion, and most significantly behavior that's based in the basal ganglia. Okay? Um, the ba this particular kind of behavior is known as habit. Attention, motivation, and habit. Habitual routines of behavior shaped by classical conditioning, cued by positive and negative, excuse me, cued by a variety of stimulus, and reinforced and strengthened by positive and negative reinforcement. Habits that are unconscious, that we never chose purposefully, that are remarkably strong and persistent. And habits that are exploited, this process of habit, the formation of habit, is actually rather well known. It's been studied extensively. And if you ever wonder whether or not the people who uh, design different technological devices and applications know the stuff and exploit it, the answer is, oh, yes, indeed. These are, not, these are creative people. They are not trying to be evil. They're just trying to be practical. Um, come back to that. But in the moment, does anybody recognize this? This look familiar? Shout it out. Thank you. Well done, Sally. OK, so let's break it down. Classical Pavlovian conditioning. Condi initially, before the bell rings, the dog goes, eh, whatever. It's a, the bell is the conditioned stimulus. But without any kind of association, there's no response. Oh, bell's ringing, whatever. Um, nothing happens. Unconditioned stimulus. You, you bring in a stimulus that is already having value, something that where we are hardwired to respond to it, in this case, dog, food, trigger for hardwired emotions related to survival. And because dogs salivate, thus you bring the food in front of the dog, uh, you got all excited, especially when you hold it right in front of them and you can't get at it, then they really get excited. And that's what Pavlov did. So woohoo, that's the unconditioned stimulus. Now you put together the conditioned stimulus, the, the bell, the unconditioned stimulus, and they form a link, an association. And you get the reflex or respondent, the conditioned behavior. Take away the unconditioned stimulus, in this case the food, you still have the behavior. Amazing, ain't it? That is the basics. Conditioned responses. So what's your bells? particularly with regard to smartphones. Think about location. Where are you when you want to check it and look at it? Think about the time of day, the sorts of situations. We talked about first thing in the morning. How about the end of the day when you're kind of winding down? How about in between classes that we talked about? How about when, you know, what are the other times that you would normally habitually, if somebody followed you around with a video camera, they'd see you every day about the same time pulling out your phone? Just, you know, think about it. The emotional state. This is a very big deal, particularly when it has to do with app development. We are often 
at the most vulnerable to the formation of habits when we are in a negative emotional state. If you're feeling distressed or bored or lonely or just eh about something, anything that you do that relieves those feelings, stimulates yourself, connects with something else, gets you distracted, is going to be a very strong reinforcer and thus something that will form a habit. Okay, other people and whatever the immediately preceding action is. Good example of that is what we talked about a minute ago, people get out of class, boom, out comes the phones. Leaving and transitions between one activity and another. Okay, make sense, this stuff? Okay, okay cool. Alrighty. This is actually a model that comes from an app developer, somebody who has written extensively in this area. And, uh, uh, sorry guys, I, let me check my notes and see recall his name for you. He's gone, da, 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 rats. That's the problem with PowerPoint is that you can't see your notes unless you have two screens or remember to bring them with you, which I didn't. But this is actually, this is about hooks. And this is from a book that was written about how to create addictive apps. There's a lot of psychological science here. It's very sophisticated, very elegant kind of model. They're thinking about the triggers that are built into each app, how people, the action, how easy the action is to take. You can't make it a complicated action. There has to be a reward. You know, oh, hey, I saw something interesting. Oh, hey, somebody sent me an email. Oh, hey, there's a new post on, you know, on Twitter. And then an investment of time or an emotional investment. Oh, I'm gonna share this information with my friends. I'm connected to it, I identify with it. All manner of this, this is just a couple of examples. And they're really explicit about talking about this stuff. And it makes sense, because if you're an app developer, what do you need to do for your app to be successful? You need to have people look at it, yeah? And share it, and spend a lot of time on it. So this is really core to the success of that kind of business. It is not an evil thing. This is a, this is just a neutral force. It's something that we can use to benefit ourselves, but we also have to be really mindful of it because it works. When somebody is thinking about, oh, I've got this awesome app and I want to make money doing it, they are not responsible for your well-being. They're responsible for theirs. And so you kind of have to take responsibility for yourself. Make sense? Okay. Behold the smartphone. And the human brain the number of neurons and neural synapses, the connections that we have in our head is amazing. It is quite, without bragging, the most complex organic form that we are aware of in the universe is one that we carry around on top of our necks every day. It's quite remarkable. So about those basal ganglia, remember I said the stuff is in the basal ganglia, there it is, it's right above the limbic system, it's a series of structures that are deep inside the cortex. So what's the deal with the basal ganglia? The basal ganglia is where the brain makes habits. And let's talk about what habits are. And we'll maybe have a little more specific question. Good specific questions with the purpose of habits, how are habits formed, and how are habits so damn strong and persistent? Like, what is the deal? How come? Well, the purpose is pretty straightforward. They are efficient behavioral routines. They serve to automate and autopilot a great many things so that we don't have to devote conscious uh, attention to them. Because if I had to think about standing on one foot while I'm talking to you, I would either fall down or not be able to talk. But the fact that I have the physical habit of balance, it's very efficient. I can do both things at the same time. I can drive and talk, that kind of stuff. Habit is autopilot, time and processing power. We would not want to live without them. They're formed by what we just talked about, behavioral conditioning and repetition. And they are physical. They are, they are more than physical. They are, well, yes, they are physical. That when you have done something repeatedly, literally the neural loops that, that give rise to that series of behaviors or reactions are strengthened and there are more connections between the neurons than there were previously. The saying is, neurons that fire together, wire together. So this is physical change that occurs. Not just, oh, I could, you know, it, I'm just thinking about these things. You, you know, stick your head in the brain scan machine, it's gonna look different. Neural loops within the basal ganglia. So the interesting thing is that if you, once you have the cue that fires off, the rest of the sequence runs. It's like a set of dominoes. It falls on the basis of a single cue, once it's well formed. 
think brushing your teeth, think, I don't know, all kinds of voluntary behavior that, were, that you had, like tying your shoes. Have you ever taught a little kid to tie their shoes? It is laborious. It is frustrating. It is difficult. All those things that if you don't think about them, you can do them really well, but if you try to think about them, then all of a sudden you're stumb stumbling over them. It's because all that, normally you do them using their, your basal ganglia, and so it runs just, the loops run just fine, but if you try to take them apart and do them consciously, they don't run so well. So anyway, basal ganglia. And the strong and persistent part, well, we talked about positive reinforcement, reward, negative reinforcement, relief. And you guys, I don't know who's taken intro psych here, talked about this kind of stuff. If you've taken this kind of stuff, we've got different, we, we talked about types of reinforcement, but then there's also the rate of reinforcement, continuous reinforcement. Um, come on, somebody help me here. There's continuous, there's intermittent, and there's, no, negative is, is type. Negative is take away. We're talking about rate. Say it again. One more time. Immediate. Yeah, yeah that's true. That, that's more of like kind of a proximal, you know, it's like how fast it happens. But immediate is really important. We'll come back to that. Anyway, we're talking about intermittent reinforcement. Intermittent is the kind that, it's, it's sorry, the third kind is like a, a um, Oh, heavens, uh, the word is escaping me, but it's, it's like every fifth time that you do something, you get reinforced. It's a, a Sally, help. A racial interval, thank you. Uh, I have a hard time coming up with words sometimes. Anyway, but intermittent reinforcement is more like life. Sometimes you get it, and sometimes you don't. It's one of the most strong and enduring ways of developing habit. It's also known as going to Vegas. Because what keeps people doing things when they're not sure that they're going to get the payoff? Maybe this time I'm going to hit. Quarter goes in the machine, you pull the lever. People will spend hours and hours and hours doing this kind of stuff. So here's a habit loop, very simple. Pared down to its just the most elemental forms. There's a cue, you have a behavior routine, there's some kind of reward, and then time passes and it cues you again, and around and around and around you go. It's not good, it's not bad, it's just how things are. So what, if you think about this, and we think about applying this to our phones, what cues you to check your phone? And probably it's better to ask yourself what doesn't. We're back to thinking about location, time, emotional state, other people, immediately preceding action. I mean, this would take a little while to, to really put up to get, you'd have to walk yourself through your day, but I would imagine you could fill a page with the things that are cues for you checking on checking your phone. What cues fire off that behavior? How many times would you guess that you check per day? Just somebody throw out a number. What would you guess? How many times you check per day? Does anybody know? 10? OK. A couple hundred? What else? What else would you think? 50, OK. Those all may be true. Research that's been done on this, where they've surveyed people, a lot of times these surveys happen at college, it starts at about 120, 150, and goes up from there. And this is like every time you, you unlock your screen, every time you pick up your phone independently, that's a check. We don't even notice it. And that, I think it's lovely, the, the range, because that really is how we feel about it. We do not know when, how much we're checking our phones. This is not a consciously mediated choice. Yes. It is picking up the phone for whatever reason, whether or not there's a notification there or you just pick up your phone to look at it because that's the behavior. You know, it's just in, in its purest form. So know your triggers. Think about this. Now, the reward is big. Each time we check, and it's back. And think, remember, we think about intermittent reinforcement. You might get something. You never know. Because our brains love stimulation. We are wired to see difference. We're, we love stim, we love novelty. You know, we, we kind of get bored with one thing, but there's something different and that, oh, oh, hey, it gets all interesting again. And we really, really, really love the chance that somebody might be wanting to connect with us. Somebody's posted something, somebody's responded to something, somebody's reached out. Just the fact that that might happen is a very strong reinforcer, very motivating for us to check over and over and over again. 
And so for smartphones train us to check too. This, the, your question about you know, when and where and how is it in response to a notification. That's actually a, a very good point because they tell us, hello, hello, you, you know, like the old you've got mail back in the olden days. Um, all those little different notifications we start to attune to. It's interesting. I was showing off my brand new, thank you very much, um, Note 5. Well, I was using HTC before this, and so switching phones meant I switched notification tones too. And it was very interesting because for the first couple of weeks, I wasn't responding to the notifications because I didn't recognize them. You know, they, they were still unconditioned stimulus, or excuse me, they were still conditioned stimulus for me. And then I learned them, and now they, the, now they start to influence my behavior. So every time it buzzes or t the tone goes off, we get this little bump of dopamine. Ooh, something's there. Ooh, somebody wants me. Ooh, you know, as if somebody specifically, specifically wants me. It's that sweet little dopamine ka -ching. Somebody out there loves me. So we get trained. It's an itch that gets scratched before we even realize that we're itchy. Before we even realize that we're itchy. And this is the problem. Because you scratch without even realizing that you're going to scratch, and particularly so when you're doing other things that occupy a lot of your attention. Driving, of course, being one of the biggest kinks in point. And the other thing, too, a lot of times is we have less self-control when we are doing something that occupies our attention because the a that activity itself taps into a lot of our volition, a lot of our awareness. It's like we're not paying attention to what we're doing because we're paying attention to our driving, but then we can start doing things that divert our attention. It's wild. So how about getting control over this? How do we do it? You know, personal responsibility? Self-control? Or like back in the days of Nancy Reagan? Just say no. Okay, well, hmm. How about willpower? Anybody hear about the uh, marshmallow experiment at Stanford? Okay. Did anybody not hear about this? A couple people? Okay, let's do it really fast. Back in the day, in the 50s, 60s, I forget. Anyway, they were looking at the nature of self-control in kids and what, what it was going to predict in terms of those kids functioning in the future. Big, lons, lon, lon, I can't say it, longitudinal study. Pretty amazing research. What they did is they took a whole bunch of four and five-year-olds, and one by one, they brought them into their room where there was a table and it had goodies on it, and they're including some marshmallows, and the, um, the experimenter would say, okay, sit right here, I'll be back in about five minutes, and you know, oh, there's some treats there on the table, and if you want to now, you can go and have one, or if you wait till I get back, you can have two or three. A little set up for self-control here. And there they were. They, then they walk out and leave the kid in the room with the marshmallows. What do you think you would have done if it had been you at five years old? What was interesting is about that happened. Some kids ate them and some kids didn't. And what was most interesting about it was how the kids who didn't grab the marshmallows, because some of them kids just marched right over there, you know, sh started shoving them in, but there were kids who didn't. So how would they go about this? Because that was the notion of willpower. They did something else. They just didn't sit there and stare at the marshmallow or pick it up or poke it or do anything. They did other things. They walked around the room or they went in the corner or they sang a little song or they, you know, like fussed with their, their uh, shoelaces. They did something else. They did not just white knuckle it. They got distracted. They, they deliberately distracted themselves. And the capacity, it's kind of like they knew in some way, even though they couldn't describe it, that they ought not to be standing there staring at those marshmallows. It was that they sort of had a concept of, them, of mind and that they were able to act proactively about it. Interesting thing was that those kids went on to do quite a bit better in school and quite a bit better in life and were healthier. It's a, I, it's a whole other conversation, but it was interesting, interesting stuff. They distracted themselves. For our purposes today, that's the big thing, is they didn't, they didn't just hang out with it. They engaged with the problem. So, habit change is a challenge. Habit change in smartphones is a big challenge. But if you have some strategies, you stand a lot better chance of being able to use it when you choose it, 
to, for it to be your servant and not your master. You don't want to rely on your conscious brain to monitor your basal ganglia. It doesn't work that way. The basal ganglia will win every time. Here's the thing, and the reason why I'm making such a big deal about this is that it kind of gets at our na the nature of our sense of self-control. Nobody wants to think that you don't have control over your actions on an everyday basis, and when other people suggest that you do, it tends to be rather offensive, and nobody wants to hear it. It's like, I don't have any strength, I'm out of control, I can't run my own life, forget that. But if we can look at it objectively, and like I said at the beginning, kind of in this curious way, so what's going on here? Then we start to see things and opportunities that may, you know, when we get our ego out of the way, we can take some effective action with. So think about the model of a diet. It's, you know, there's some analogies between food and smartphone use. Smart, you know, just like we gotta eat, technology is not going to go away. We pretty much, at least in our culture, in our society, at this point in time, we are, you know, it's not like you really, truly have an option without there being some fairly significant consequences. Naturally, you could not use a phone a lot more easily than you could not eat and go ahead and live your life. I do grant you that. But we might as well learn to live with it because of the nature of things. Yet if we think about, you know, junk food versus nutritious and healthy food, we may see some parallels here. What do you get when you eat junk food? It's good, it's snacky, it's yummy, it's right now, it's easy to eat, there's no thought about it, and it's boom, immediate, you know, somebody said immediate gratification. In the food world, it's all about that. But right afterwards, ugh, not so much. There's no satisfaction there, there's no nutritional value to it. And if we overload on it, we don't feel, we don't function well. Our wellness, our health is adversely impacted. So it, it's a nice, you know, it's a pretty straightforward model in terms of thinking about use, misuse, excessive use of phones. Because healthy food, well, it may not be as easy to get to. It may not be as effortless. You have to plan a little bit. You have to make some, ch you know, deliberate choices to get it because because what's in the machines and what's super easy to hand is tends to be the junky stuff. But you're rewarded. Sometimes you're rewarded immediately because it's yum. Also, you're rewarded not only right away, but you're rewarded over the long haul. You feel better. You feel better throughout the day, and you have a greater sense of well-being overall. So the analogy holds, yeah? It's not so instantly gratifying, but we know that, and we regard it as a good thing to, like, okay, yeah, you know, i got to wait a little longer. I have to pack my lunch instead of just, you know, going to McDonald's. And we regard that as a virtue, and we appreciate that about ourselves. And we think about our cues and choices. Anybody who's tried to change what they eat and change their diet has gotten pretty familiar with their cues and their choices. And it is, it is something to be appreciative of. OK. So here's some tips about how to be the master and not the servant. And then let's talk a little bit after that. So this is just a set that I kind of cobbled together from what other people have said and some ideas that I came along before. First off is you want to be the smart one. OK? This whole thing about tech will get you. It's just, it's not willpower. Willpower is not the main issue here. Where we use willpower, we use character, is in our understanding of, of the issue as it is, and in our savvy about how we make choices and how we adopt strategies and how we stick to the ongoing process of managing this in a way that works for us. That's where willpower shows up, not just, just say no. So we're cultivating self-control, awareness, and deliberate action. The just do it thing, um, it's good, but it doesn't do the whole job. Change the environment. Ah, what a concept. Remember how at the beginning I said turn off? If you happen to have it still on, stick it at the bottom of your bag. It will be interesting as you guys get out and at some point, either in a few minutes or a little later on today, look at your phone if any notifications happened of which you were unaware. That might be kind of a cool thing. Oh, they happened. Didn't distract me. Nice. Alerts, changing them so they don't go off during school, that they're silent, that they don't vibrate. Even things like rearranging your home screen so that there aren't any apps that, oh, every time that you open up your phone that are going to say, hello, somebody wants you. Put those on the next screen so that they aren't there visible to your eye. It's a little thing, but... If you, like me, find that if you have a notification that says, oh, someone sent you an email and you feel like you just really need to have to check, even though it's something that isn't really for you at all, 
then not having that on your home screen might buy you a little space and time. It's called a boundary. And you can set physical boundaries, making it harder to pick up the phone, which makes it easier on you in making the choice. For instance, you remove the temptation, charge the phone someplace else than your blessed bedroom. You know, just don't have it there. You don't have to not pick it up, just don't have it there. Stick it someplace else. Isn't that pretty? I bet if you went on Pinterest, you'd see about a billion of these. Dare to go low tech. Alarm clocks still exist. They work really well. And if you have a hard time, oh, I can't do that, I have a hard time getting up, you put one by your bed, and then you put another one across the room, or even better yet, in the bathroom, if that works for you, so that by the time you get to turn the damn thing off, you're already up. Handy. Um, I got some great ones that I use in my office because I can't track time, and I think Amazon, like 11 bucks. They're really good. Wear a wristwatch. Who in here has a wristwatch? Wow, look around, the guys in front. We have like maybe 10% maybe. So when do other people get out their, phone, their phones a lot of time? Check what time it is. Have you ever gotten out your phone just with the intention of checking time and then found 20 minutes later, oh, sh I love that look, she's going, yeah, mm-hmm. Okay, well, and then, marvel of marvels. If you don't want to check your phone in the car, what about putting it in the trunk? <gasps> Who would think of such a thing? We don't even think about these things. It's ridiculous. There it is. This handy little storage compartment. Everybody's got one. You could get really creative, too. See what's going on here? This is from a bar in uh, Rio de Janeiro, which is why it's in Portuguese. They actually took Pilsner glasses and ground down the bottom so that you have to put them on something, so that you can't be looking at the phone. If you're sitting there, having a beer, then you end up, your head's up, you're chatting with people, you're looking around. It actually becomes the social and convivial activity that it was supposed to be. It's amazing. And you know what? These phones are supposed to be smart, right? Exploit that. Um, this is a whole bunch of apps. I just went into Google Play, since I'm an uh, Android kind of girl and put in smartphone addiction. And look what happened. Here's one called break free, focus lock, focus on, stay focused. Um, you behind is a checker, smartphone addict, um, all kinds of stuff. There are apps that to help you do this. Let me run through a few. Here's awareness apps, and, and I make no claim as to their wondrousness or anything. These are just apps that that is what they do. For those of you who are thinking, okay, how often do I really check my phone? Hey, there's an app for that. Here's a very plain one, Checky. But look too, they've gotten social with it. You can t get your phone friends on it and then you all see how much each other are checking their phones. That would be very interesting. This other one, nomophobia. Nomophobia is the fear of being without your smartphone. There's actually a word for it. And so this gives you a little graph of where you are, how long it's been. See, this little thing in the bottom says, you lasted 34 seconds since <laughs> checking your phone. So that each time you pick it up, it's like it tells you how long was it, has it been. And the whole business of uh, when did you check and what was going on, you got a little graph there, gives you some information. You checked your phone how many times in the past hour, you lasted at how many minutes between the time you looked at it, and the longest you've gone in the past hour is how long. Of course, one might think, do I really want to know that? But come on, inquiring minds. You can do it, you're tough. You can handle the information. Here's another one, an automation app. This is the kind of app where you set it up to do certain activities at certain times. I've got one where if I get to certain locations, it turns the ringer off. If I get to certain locations, Wi-Fi goes on or off. I could, if I chose to, set it up that when I get in my car and it, and it picks up the signal of the car, that it automatically sends out a text that says, so I'm driving, I'm getting back to you later. So then people don't say, well, why didn't you respond to my text? Of course, I'm kind of too old for that. They know that I you know, have a life. But uh, that literally, you've got it built in. You set it, and you forget it. You don't have to use any willpower. And so you just build it in. You know, so if you ever had your phone go off in the middle of a lecture or a meeting or someplace that was embarrassing, this is a very nice alternative for that as well, too, this sort of thing. Now, here's interesting. This game of, you, know, you gamify it. You set it up. Anybody here ever played Farmville? They used to be on Facebook. 
it's one of those ones where you have to go and cultivate your little farm. There's a whole bunch of these things, and if you don't go back and do it enough enough, things die. And they, it's amazing. Like these are little digital images, but they suck people in. It's, you know, it's like, ugh, I don't even want to get into the implications of self-control, but you know what I'm talking about. So this one is called Forest. And what it does is that you start out with your little tree, and then you tell it how long you want to go between, you know, how long you want to spend off the phone. And if you're able to do that, your tree gets bigger, and it, you know, it goes from a little leaf, and it grows, and it has fruit on it, and it thrives. But if you're checking your phone more frequently, mm, it doesn't, it's, it's this very powerful visual representation. And if Farmville could make people cra you know, crazy and motivate behavior, then here we go. This could too. But this is using it as a force for good, as a, as a support for conscious awareness and choice. It's like you're gaming your own system. It's amazing. You could also leverage social support. Ever played phone stack? Anybody know what phone stack is? Tell. You fight, stack the phones. So if you go out with a bunch of people and everybody stacks their phone, then what? Got it. Or whatever. But that's the classic. You know, they buy the next round, or they have to give everybody coffee or a cookie, you know, or whatever. And so that means that the phones are down, and people are talking to each other. What a concept. And it's, you know, it's, a, it's that common agreement. Take a day off. There is, as you probably, everybody's heard, there is you know, fits and starts and ways in different places, this whole idea about digital detox or unplug for a day or this deliberate no phones at dinner and for an hour afterwards. Literally, instead of expecting ourselves to you know, switch between, oh, I'm looking at my phone, now I'm talking to my kid, to have a time where everybody's kind of like, okay, we're well, putting it down. And we put them away and you turn it off and you go old school, you interact. It's an amazing thing. What's happened when people have done this is that it tends to take a little while. Oftentimes, when people do digital detoxes, what they'll say is it took about a day, maybe a little longer, maybe a little less, to not keep wondering, and then it kind of fades out. And it's kind of nice. It's nice. And then when you get back into it, it's always, you know, just goes back right back into being interesting. So the idea is that you routinely unplug for a little bit particularly within a family, particularly with you know, the people that you're close to in these kinds of situations. Dark for dinner, it's kind of, it looked really sweet. Okay, and you use our higher level pro cognitive processes. Use the prefrontal cortex, use the thing that it seems to be, as far as we can tell, unique to us human beings, the ability to think ahead, plan ahead, anticipate future consequences, alternative courses of action, and decide to do things on that basis, and then bring it back into what we do, those little choices every day that support our overall wellness. Value yourself for being persistent, for not giving up. Begin again, begin again, begin again, and begin again. It's not a one-time thing. These things are processes. Wellness is a process. And if you get off track, you get off track. You get back on over and over and over and over and over and over again, because that actually is the way it works. Just to let you know, in case anybody still has the notion that you're going to get to a certain point of maturity and everything is going to line up and it will, life will be easier, I got to tell you, we all work on it and we work on it all the time and actually that's okay. Whatever it may be. In this case, we're talking about smartphone use, it could be diet, it could be all kinds of stuff. I will say that after a while, routines of behavior come in and it's a lot easier to make the choices that you've been making for a long time. So healthy habits do get a little bit easier, but we still have to realign and restart over and over again. And that's really, really okay. So, there we go. If you want to talk some more about this in a more particular way, of whether it's about this or anything else, come and see us. I'm at the Health Center. We've got two awesome postdoctoral fellows this year. We would love to come talk to you. So, have, be well. And we've got a few minutes, so let's have some conversation. Let's have some conversation. Let's think about this here for a second. If you were going to think about the kinds of, do you think you need to make changes with your smartphone use? Okay, you're nodding. Can I pick on you? Oh, and by the way, I need a volunteer. May, sir, may I volunteer you to be my microphone monkey? This is for the recording. 
This microphone will not amplify things. It will only, Michael, am I good? Cool, yeah. It will only, um, amp for the, the recording for your voice, so you still have to speak up. Who's got a question? You were, I picked on you, I was gonna ask you to say, why do you think you need to change your smartphone use? Will you please tell us? Okay, so go for it. Um, I feel like it uh, affects like my sleep, sleep schedule a lot. Like I'm always on my phone at nighttime and I wanna read at night, but I get distracted by my phone and I'm always playing on it. Okay, anybody else know about this, getting distracted and playing games and then all of a sudden it's like 1 a.m. and you didn't really plan for it to be 1 a.m., but there you are at 1 a.m.? That person said yes. Would you give the microphone to that person? And if you have an idea, even if you're not sure it's going to work, about what you might do instead. What I do is I just turn my phone off. Off, off? Yeah. Ooh. I don't really care about charging it. What? Uh, what? That's control. Yeah. You're not relying on the self-control. Awesome. Coming down, okay. I try to actually be smart about the alarms. I basically have four alarms that go off in the morning. So the first one I know is just that you know groggy can barely wake up. The second alarm means okay, stop on Facebook, get up, <laughs> get going. So you, you sequence yourself to before you have to get up and go do something. You yes, literally again, build in transition time. And again at nighttime with the other alarms. So yes, and then I use different tones to basically elicit different Pavlovian responses oh. as you will. If it works for you, it works. Okay. Other, other thoughts? Oh, yeah. You know, there seems to be a problem with that. Um, you see, no one, like, you have to have your phone on all the time for your, like, my, like my family because I have to pick up the phone. We can't have landlines anymore for uh -huh. some reason. They, they're against that for some reason. It's too much money, so. But so part of the problem that you're facing is that your folks kind of need or expect yeah, you to be Yeah, they need available. me to keep the phone on all the time. It's annoying, and, and I just, like, I didn't even use it as a phone. I used it as a computer TV. Okay. Well, so is that the kind of thing where they might need to, if they knew your schedule when you're in class or when you have deliberately planned times to be unavailable, it's then, it's, then it's kind of old school? I mean, your folks did yeah. grow up in the same era yeah. that I did when you couldn't get a hold of everybody all the time. Okay. And you knew, oh, yeah, they'll be available at 2.30 when yeah. the lecture gets over. Oh, my mom's kind of lazy. She's like, oh, I don't want to pick up to tell you to do something. I want to just, I'm not even going to walk over there. I'm just going to call you, you know? Yeah, sometimes you got to work with those people. Ugh. You got to work with them. Right. It's true. But sometimes, too, if they know sort of what the consequences are, oh, I would like this time so I can focus and study, eh, I don't know. Sometimes it could be an interesting conversation. It might be a conversation that happen, needs to happen a couple of times, though, too. It's funny how addicted we get to that quick response. It's amazing. It's amazing. Somebody else, a comment? You're getting your exercise, thank you. We appreciate that. That's why that if you've ever seen a video of something where someone asks a question and you can't hear what they're saying, I appreciate your patience for this. I like the point that you brought up about keeping the phone in the other room. In another Say louder. I like the point that you made about keeping your phone in another room. Because I, uh, when I go to sleep, I keep my phone in sort of the office. So I keep it all the way down the hallway. It's nice. In the room, and how did you figure out how to do that? What? How did you come up with the idea of doing that? I was just my, uh, my parents don't want us to be always. Oh, oh, you've just done my mother's heart so much good. You know, right? Folks actually had a reasonable idea and you're like, oh, okay, this reasonable idea and you sort of do it. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I do have an actual alarm clock. <gasps> good. Yay. And, you know, it may not seem like a big thing, yeah. but for the person, you know, it's, it's just weird. We don't think of those of us that sort of make these choices without really thinking through the ramifications of them. It's like, oh, wait, there is this other alternative. And how, you know, how simple it seems. How simple it seems. Oh, other thoughts? Right, right behind you. I just uh, deleted Twitter and Instagram. Like, I don't need them, so. Deleted Instagram, okay. 
And can we ask how come? Uh, I mean, there's nothing useful on them. Anything about it, like a post you see today, you're not going to remember in a month. You're just going to forget about it, and you're just wasting your time with it. So it's kind of like saying, okay, fine, it's great, it's lovely, it's fine, but I want to put my attention someplace else? Yeah, there's something that's actually going to make an impact on your okay. life. Yeah. We've only got so many minutes in the day. We only have so much attention to spread around. Exactly. It's interesting. One of the things that I have seen over the years is people come in, you know, just recurrent themes in people's lives, you know, like folks that come in for counseling appointments at the health center. And I cannot tell you how many times I've heard people say, okay, that's it. It's done. I deleted my Facebook. I, you know, I put my Twitter on, I don't know what the, the right term for it, but you uh, kind of, you suspend the account where you don't shut it down, but you suspend it for a while. And they have to do that, particularly after a breakup or after there's been some kind of conflict, because otherwise the itch to check and check and check and check is so strong that it's making them crazy. And quite frankly, I've always welcomed that as a good thing. I mean, it's, you know, if you feel for the person because things were so painful that they got to that point, but that they are willing to take that step and, and not force themselves to endure it usually is a good thing. But you can always tell when someone is up here with it when they're like, okay, that's it, I suspend the account. What about the driving thing? Anybody have any success at managing that? I keep my phone in my pocket while I drive. And, uh, when the phone goes off, I just let it ring. It's just sort of, don't bother with it. You'll be fine. I commend you. I commend you. It is really hard. It is really hard not to check. And so I would imagine, too, if we took a quick survey about how the difficulty, relative difficulty, that we have about not responding to notifications, we'd probably see it then, you know, it would vary along the normal curve like everything else. Some people would be, have less difficulty, some people would have more difficulty, and then we'd have kind of a normal range in between. So two people up in the back. funny, we got a car that has a, a smart car, it's got the screen on it, and it will tell you when you get text messages. It's like, I don't want to know, don't even tell me. Um, the way I do it when I'm on the phone, or like when it rings, I'm in the car, I'll do what he does, or I'll have my secretary, aka my little brother, check it. And I'm like, hey bro, I don't want to crash, like, can you check it, what does it say? Your secretary, this is nice. I don't have one, but it's usually the person's with me, is like, can you check it, like, who it is? And if it's like someone, it's like, whatever, I'll, like, I'll just call them later, I'll just wait. I'll have my secretary get back to you, thank you very much. That's what I tend nice, to do. Nice, great. But um, my phone is basically just always off, uh, on silent. So I never see it, and it's always face down. So I never check the screen. So did you start out like this? Well, when I started out with the phone, I just never had it, and that's been a problem because my parents, whenever they've been trying to get a hold of me, they can't. Um, but, so I've had to have one on, but I can't, the ringer just sometimes is too loud. And then even if when I adjust it, sometimes the specific Just even the lowest setting, it's too loud? Exactly, yeah. and well, sometimes it just, I don't, um, my hearing just is very, sometimes I have to like So really it's all sort of aversive for you to have it on in a way. Exactly. Yeah, that's, it's, it's so interesting. I, I, and what's interesting for me right now is I have some, um, I'm finding that my assumptions about, oh, this everybody wants to have their phone on all the time is not actually, you know, the case, at least not, not among us today. You know, everybody has a wide range of experience. Even people who are, you know, kind of people who came up while phone use was, was well available. Has anybody have ever had the experience of where, like, do you remember what it was like before you had a smartphone? Anybody, one of those people whose parents were, were would not let them get a smartphone until they were a lot older? So what was that like when you finally got it? Anybody? Whatever. Sorry, just proximity. proximity. Oh, well, when I didn't have my smartphone, I felt like kind of uncool, like... Everybody yeah, asked me something you didn't know. Stuff, like, um, so when I got it, I was like, all oh, right, yeah, I fit in. That's why I got one, so. And how did you find the, the expectation versus the day-to-day -day reality of it? Did, it? did it connect you more? I mean, yeah. I got way more distracted in class, though, but that's about it. Uh, funny how that works. Not in Sally's class, or not in your health class, or not, okay. Can I make yeah. an observation? 
please. Um, since I've been running around with the microphone, my, my hand has brushed my pocket a few times, and that's always where I keep my phone. It's in my bag now. I've had three or four mini panic attacks. <laughs> I left my phone. I left my phone. Just I knowing phone. that it's not there, even though I know actually where it is, I'm, my body is reacting before I can consciously think about it. Yeah. That's funny. That's great. Um, you and then. Um, to go off what he said, sometimes I'll have my phone in my hand and then I'll be panicking because I don't know where my phone is because I'll normally keep it in like a certain spot and I have like a huge oh wait <laughs> yeah I'll have like a mini panic attack I'm like well, where is my phone where is it like where did I leave it I'm like oh it's in my hand and then I feel really <laughs> stupid yeah <laughs> yeah distraction happens in all kinds of ways and shapes and forms and <sighs> funny how all this stuff works comments from this side of the things you guys have or I, and actually, let me not neglect the gentleman right behind you. Well, when I first got my s first um, smartphone, it was amazing because I get to stay on top of everything. And, but, you know, I knew, but before that, I had a bad Internet addiction. And I didn't want my eyes to, you know, be burned out of my skull all the time because mm -hmm. I was looking at, my fo looking at screens every day of my life, which I was kind of sick of. And so... Um, so it kind of became a problem, and I got distracted, and it kept running out of battery, and people kept yelling at me. <laughs> so what are you doing that, that, to moderate some of this? What are you, what are you trying? Well, I try to keep the, it, when it's charging, I try to keep it in my backpack, probably a place where I won't touch it like that area, and then go to the front room and do something else. So phys you, know, you just make it easier on yourself so that it isn't within arm's reach? Yes. It's not like in your pocket? I really have hand. to do other things. <laughs> it, seductive little dudes they are okay. okay it's funny how all this stuff works it for those of us that you know of my age that where you had a full and complete and total fully adult connected life prior to smartphone use it's very interesting to see how intensely habit changes within at least for me within the context of our own lives and i think that there's a fair amount of difference between people who didn't have smartphone use growing up in terms of the range in which you know who's an early adopter who falls down the tech rabbit hole you know there's just a lot of variation there because i know a lot of people who still aren't that into it but you know i'm i probably am a, at least a standard deviation and a half perhaps above the mean in that regard go ahead um i my first year of college i lived in san francisco and i didn't have a smartphone and, in um, San Francisco, my goodness. It was like the worst experience of my life. I, the, I never had a smartphone and I got my first, I had to wait till Apple or Verizon got the, app, uh, mm. got the iPhone. And that was, it was only recently. So I, um, I, and that was the year after I went to school. And so I didn't get it until the year after. And I was like, this would have been so amazing. I was lost 99% of the time. I was, I didn't have a phone with a map. I didn't have a phone with, um, I just had to, I had to call taxi drivers and wait like 45 minutes for them to show up. There was no Uber. There was none of this, and it was like the worst. Maps like paper? Thing, no, you know? well, you know those are very confusing. Ah. <laughs> I had one, didn't know how to use it, which probably, anyway, that would have been. Yeah. Well, but that's a good point too, because if you didn't get oriented to the use of a paper map and you're accustomed to navigation systems, it's a very different way of relating spatially. I find even now that I don't really like navigation system as much as I like paper maps because I can see where I am in space. I get to orient myself in the larger context. But I love maps, and I came up until my 40s and you know using paper maps. So I still don't like using the navigation system in my car. But that's a, you know it's it's how we're shaped by experience. Yeah. Yeah. It's remarkable I how this stuff shifts around. Okay. One more comment, and then we'll we'll probably well, a couple more comments. Then I. I have to scamper out of here in five minutes, and I would imagine other people do too. Yeah. So uh, I think it was about it was 16 when I got my phone, my smartphone, and before that we, I didn't really use phones that often because we were always together, my family and I. And so now that I'm always going around, I, I kind of need it to like stay in touch with people. So. Interesting the thought that one could actually raise children or be a kid and not have this immediate contact with everybody around you. And I, and it's hard to see, like, I see all these little kids going around and they're like, mm -hmm. got these iPhones, they're like only like eight or nine. I'm like, it's a big what are you doing with that? Or babies that are swiping and scrolling and pinching and zooming. 
before they, they can, I mean, very readily, 18 months, 20 months, 24 months. This is going to be an interesting thing. You, at some point, will be looking back, you'll feel old, and say, but I didn't do that. And why are they, you know, that separation? But we are in the middle of a giant experiment right now, the giant laboratory. Things are changing around. See, I think there was someone, a lady on this side, with comment, and then one more. Just an observation since I grew up way before there were cell phones. Teenage girls will never know what it feels like to sit around the house oh, and yeah. wait for the phone, phone call. to ring. <laughs> oh, to get, say, get off the phone. I'm expecting a really important call. You never have that experience. It's wild. Like, how do you relate to all those songs from the 50s? Right. You know, the context is completely different. The, but the other thing, too, is me and my friends grew up in the day and age where we talked on the phone. So we text. Not a whole heck of a lot, just if it's like a quick bit of information. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, it's like, let's actually sit down and talk on the phone and devote attention to it. I you get know, annoyed with people who call me while they're standing in line and want to have a conversation. Oh, your brain is happier, yeah? That's the other thing. You know, and don't even get me started about texting and relationships. I could have a big rant about that, but there's just not enough information, emoticons nonwithstanding. There's not enough information on a text message to convey emotional nuance. Our orbital frontal cortices do not know what to do with that, and we get a little freaked out. So, Hi. Um, I don't own a, a smartphone. Haven't. And you might look at me and go, well, she's older. But I work in technology, and I ran a cost-benefit analysis on owning a smartphone, mm -hmm. and I decided it wasn't worth the cost. I didn't want to spend all that money being distracted, um, what I do is solve fairly complex problems, <laughs> and I don't even like music playing you when need I'm long trying. Long periods of sustained, undistracted time. And I'm very—I can get very focused. I'm very successful at what I do, and I've noticed that other people who are very successful tend to be people who can focus on what needs to be done. And if you're getting distracted. It's not going to help you. Yeah. But I like it being around people with smartphones because I can get them to do things for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Okay. Any final comment, thoughts, question? Okay. Well, thank you all for coming and participating in the conversation. Appreciate it. <laughs>